Hi everyone, I'm going to be discussing Batfish, a tool we developed to find bugs in network configurations. This is joint work with Stanley and Todd from UCLA, Lewis and Ramesh from USC, and Megan Ratul from Microsoft Research. So misconfigurations in networks are extremely common. Um, uh, just last year, uh, a major bug in Time Warner's uh, network configurations caused an outage affecting all of their customers for multiple hours. These misconfigurations are extremely common and extremely expensive, so we would like to avoid them. But why do these misconfigurations happen in the first place? Well, the main reason is that configurations contain a ton of low-level directives, uh, such as interface-level metrics, protocol metrics, per-network policy, per-peer policy, instrumentation, management, all these other things that we hope map to high-level intent. But in order to implement that intent, you need to correctly specify a configuration for multiple protocols, BGP, ISIS, OSPF, MPLS, all these other things. And furthermore, these protocols interact with each other in complicated ways, like route redistribution. And even once you get all that down in your head, you still have to write it in the correct way in the variety of uh, network configuration languages that might actually appear in a typical enterprise network, like Cisco, Arista, Quanta, Juniper, et cetera. Um, so uh, to give you a, a taste of, of how difficult this is, here's an example. That's an idealized version of one of the networks we analyzed. Uh, we have a network N in the center, and we have a simple high-level intent here. We just want this 10 triple O network residing on a link between N2 and N10 to be reachable from the customer C and unreachable uh, from the provider P since it's an internal network, and we don't want it to be accessible uh, to any routers that are not along the path. Uh, from C to 10 triple O. So in order to implement uh, that high level intent, uh, we've written um, some configs. And uh, I just want to show you the pieces in N2 and N3 that actually help to implement this. So if you look at that first highlighted line three, uh, basically it's just saying that there's this IP address 10 001 on the interface between N2 and N10, which gives it that 10 triple O network. And then the next line says that we will redistribute that 10 triple O network into OSPF with a metric of 10. So that uh, you'll see that green arrow shows that uh, where that gets redistributed. And in order to make it unreachable uh, from P and N4, we install a black hole route in, in that line four you see on the right, uh, which is a static route which will drop any traffic destined for 10 triple O that uh, arrives at the N3 router. And uh, Additionally, that uh, black hole route will be redistributed into OSPF in order to prevent N4 from, uh, well, actually to, to sync traffic from N4 destined uh, there. So once we implement this, we see that actually uh, some traffic from C2 is being intermittently dropped. And the bug uh, that occurs is an example of what we call multipath uh, sorry, a violation of what we call multipath consistency. It's based on a real bug we found in one of the networks we analyzed, and it was buried uh, very, very deeply in those thousands of lines of configs. And what actually happens is that since N1 receives both of the redistributed routes, uh, the one from N2, which delivers traffic, and the one from N3, which drops traffic, uh, and they have the same metric, that it will, uh, it's, it will use multipath routing, Half the traffic it receives from N2 destined for 10 triple O will go through N2 and reach the destination, and the other half will go to N3 where it is promptly discarded. And that's obviously uh, problematic. Uh, so how do we actually find these bugs? Well, there have been two prior threads uh, of research, essentially. Uh, the first uh, data plane analysis uh, embodied in tools such as uh, Anteater and, and header space analysis. Uh, they start from a data plane snapshot taken from the routers in a running network. And since you have the data plane, it has well understood semantics. You can check any forwarding property using the constraint solver of your choice. Uh, the, the problem with data plane analysis is since you have to pull this snapshot from a running network, you can only uh, do a reactive analysis. Uh, to address that, uh, static analysis tools such as RCC and IP Assure will start from the configuration files themselves and that allows them to have a proactive analysis. And, uh, but the issues with these tools is while they're able to find uh, a lot of different bugs uh, related to a lot of different properties, they use models that are customized to find uh, those bugs in specific aspects of the configuration. They don't actually produce the data plane, so they cannot directly check forwarding properties and show you, you know, the impact on forwarding that any bug 
uh, any particular bug has. So our approach is actually to combine the benefits of these two prior threads of research uh, by starting from the configurations and uh, using them to actually compute what we uh, believe the data plane would be uh, if those uh, configurations were on routers live in a network. And now that we have the data plane, we can use all of the, the data plane analysis uh, tools from before uh, that you see in the data plane analysis thread. The major contribution here is actually this link from configuration to data plane state, uh, which wasn't done before. The, the link from data plane state to violations of forwarding variants you see at the bottom right there is obviously already implemented uh, in the data plane analysis tools, although we did uh, make our own uh, slight contributions there. So the reason why uh, previous tools have not computed the data plane is that it's actually extremely challenging. Uh, and the reasons are, as I explained before, uh, you actually, in order to get the, the network working correctly, you need to accurately model a plethora of low-level configuration directives. And in addition, you want to be able to provide a high-level understanding of any of these errors uh, to the operators, something that you wouldn't necessarily get in simulation tools. While you can certainly confirm that bugs exist, it's very hard to discover what the provenance is of those errors. So uh, the way we uh, approach this is that by implementing a high-fidelity declarative model of the control plane, this model is comprised of a set of relations that express the network's control plane computation, uh, and they are composed of facts that are extracted from the configurations, uh, and as, as well as uh, rules for deriving new facts that you might have, let's say, about the BGP ribs, uh, how they might be populated, or the forwarding entries that you end up with. And we believe one of our contributions is that we can show that you actually can accurately model the control plane for real configs using this declarative approach. And the advantage of using a declarative approach is that you can now query these relations uh, to get the intermediate results of the data plane computation uh, to help uh, a user or operator in, in debugging and, and understanding any errors that, that are found. This approach is implemented in our tool which is called Batfish. It's available at www.batfish.org. I encourage you to check it out. We use it to find real bugs in some real enterprise networks as a four-stage pipeline, uh, which I will explain to you now. So as I said before, a declarative model is comprised of relations. Uh, here are some simple ones that we get uh, from the configs and from the topology. So at the bottom, you'll see this relation OSPF cost. And there's one fact in this OSPF cost relation, which is extracted from that first line of the configuration on top, basically just saying that you are running OSPF on the interface int 31 on N3, and it has uh, a link cost of 1. Uh, similarly, you see that edge in the example topology produces a fact in the land neighbors uh, relation, which just uh, is a way of expressing the physical topology. So and this one is just saying that N3 is connected to N1 uh, uh, from N31 to N13. In addition to those symbol relations, we also have derived relations, uh, which are produced by the data plane generator, uh, which contains the rules for deriving those relations. And as I said before, this stage is, is the key contribution. Uh, so, so one of the facts, uh, sorry, one of the relations uh, that is derived, uh, if you go back to the running example, we have this OSPF export relation, and facts in this relation indicate uh, routes that should be redistributed into OSPF. So from the running example, if you remember, we had that router N2 that's redistributing the 10 triple O network into OSPF with a cost of 10, and that's uh, shown here. Uh, these derived relations uh, get used by other derived relations. So later on in the computation, we have this installed route relation, which uh, represents the, the routing tables that uh, sh are populated on, on each node. So for example, N1 will have an installed route fact uh, saying that it has a route to 10 triple O uh, that goes through next top N2 uh, received through protocol OSPF. And uh, the end uh, result of all of these computations is that you have this FIB relation representing the forwarding tables. Uh, so uh, to, to keep this example going, N1 would have a FIB entry for the 10 triple O network saying that, uh, that traffic destined for that network should go out interface int 1, 2. Now that you have the data plane, you can check any forwarding property that you wish using your favorite data plane analyzer. Uh, I just want to make a quick comment. You, you might notice that there are multiple data planes uh, on the, in the figure at the top. And the reason is because some of the properties you check might actually be regarding a, a, the difference between two data planes. And I'll, I'll explain more about that later. And if we uh, go back to our running example, I said that there was a violation of what we call multipath consistency. And the, the, in the data plane analysis stage, we use a, an SMT solver to, to find counterexamples to whatever properties we're interested in. A counterexample in this case 
uh, is uh, essentially a pair of an ingress node and a packet header. So one counterexample you might come up with would be uh, 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 have ingress node N1 and a destination IP 10002 with just some concrete source IP and IP protocol numbers that happen to work, just all zeros uh, works in this case. And once we have those counterexamples, we can get uh, information uh, relating to provenance. Uh, so we have uh, essentially the equivalent of a trace route relation, you can think of it, uh, that's automatically produced called flow path history. So that counterexample, uh, if you were to actually inject such a packet um, into ingress node N1, uh, you can see what would happen to it. So there'd be a first hop uh, along one path going from N1 to N2, and then another hop from N2 to N10 where that packet would be accepted. But since we're using multipath routing, and if you remember in the example, there was also another uh, path that it took. Uh, alternatively, that you could go through, uh, the first hop could go from N1 to N3, where it would probably be discarded because of that black hole route. And you can use uh, this flow path history relation and others uh, like the OSPF export and installed route relation I showed you earlier to map back to the configuration directives uh, that are involved in this bug and to aid in understanding the, uh, the source of these errors. So recall that since we produce the data plane, you can actually ask any question expressible as a forwarding invariant. Part of our contribution is the introduction of three novel invariants. The first is multipath consistency, which I've uh, shown you and, and was in the example. And that is violated if you have, if you can come up with a packet uh, that can take multiple paths, at least one of which reaches the destination and has the packet be accepted, and at least one of which causes the packet to be dropped. So in this example, you have a violation of multipath consistency. The next uh, forwarding property, excuse me, um, invariant that we came up with is uh, failure consistency, which uh, relates to fault tolerance. In this example network, uh, N1 is accepting advertisements for triple two O and triple three O, and N2 uh, from the customer C, and N2 is accepting only announcements for triple two O. So there's a lack of fault tolerance for triple three O because if you turn off this link, uh, then any, then the network N will no longer be aware of any routes to triple three O. So uh, triple three O be no longer reachable. You d don't have fault tolerance, it's a violation. Uh, and the last property that we introduced uh, in our paper is a, we call destination consistency. And uh, the crux of it is that is a property intended for networks that delegate unique portion of uh, the address space to customers. Uh, and the idea is that packets for any given destination address should only be sent to one customer under any network conditions. Uh, so under the normal network conditions here, uh, network N has a route to 1001 from CA, and it doesn't use the route to 1001 being advertised uh, through B because it has a longer AS path length. So under normal conditions, it'll just send 1001 bound traffic here. But under the condition, let's say that CA is disabled, uh, since there's no filtering uh, in this network, then it'll install that 1001 route that it gets uh, from B through CB, and then you actually would end up sending traffic to this other AS, uh, which is a violation here because the intention is that uh, uh, you can only uh, go to one AS uh, with any given destination address under any conditions. So our implementation uh, s uh, of Batfish supports uh, a variety of configuration languages. We handle iOS, NXOS, Juniper, Arista, Quanta, um, I think a couple others uh, that are Cisco-like, and we support a, br a broad array of features, including route redistribution, internal and external OSPF routes, BGP communities, route reflection, route redistribution, route tagging, interface, ACLs, policy statements. We have sufficient feature coverage to model several large networks, which we actually did, but in the face of this broad uh, free feature support, we make analysis tractable by filtering all uh, the, uh, these features down to unified vendor neutral intermediate representation. And as we've added more features and built out a sufficient set of primitives uh, to model configuration, adding new directives from vendors often only requires a conversion to this unified format. So now you know how Batfish works. Let's talk about what we actually did. So we evaluated it on two large university networks. We'll call them Net1 and Net2. Uh, net 1 and Net 2 are qualitatively different. The, the first network is composed of uh, a core of 21 routers, and it's uh, in a federation, so every department uh, is connected to the core uh, through BGP peering, whereas uh, Net 2 is a, is a centralized network that has a core network of about 17 routers, and the way that they segment traffic uh, with the uh, for the departments is by using, uh, heavily using VLANs and, and IGP uh, 
stuff. So we got uh, some good feedback from the operators of Net1. Uh, he sent us an email saying, PS, with respect to that prefix that was dual signed from yesterday, this prefix that we reported, uh, one of our uh, network operations center guys stopped by today to ask what voodoo we were using to find such thing. I was pretty proud of that. Um, yeah, so let's talk about what we actually found. <clears throat> Just a, a first comment about this results table. You'll notice that there's no destination results for Net2, and the reason is because Net2 doesn't have any departments that it peers with, so it doesn't really have any customers, so that property doesn't really make any sense here. So we only uh, ran the, fir the first few properties there. Uh, comment about the numbers, on the left you have the, the total number of counter examples that we found. Uh, yeah, um, for some definition of counter example. And in the, on the right, in parentheses, you'll see uh, the total number of distinct causes of problems uh, with respect to the actual uh, configuration files. So you can look at either number and, uh, and, and decide whatever you think is important uh, to look at. Um, so now we also uh, present the number of violations that are confirmed by the operators. You'll notice that there's only a difference here for failure consistency, and this is uh, primarily due to conscious decisions not to uh, deploy additional resources that would allow for fault tolerance. Uh, so in those cases, we don't actually consider those to be you know, confirmed errors. Uh, for the violations that we report that were fixed by the operators, there's uh, differences in the numbers due to various factors. Um, among them, a reluctance to disturb a working system, which is very common uh, in a, the mentality of a network operator. Uh, in other cases, there was a need to coordinate with operators of other networks, especially with Net1, where they have uh, this federated architecture, and so that couldn't be done right away. And in the case, that, especially for failure consistency, uh, uh, you need to install new equipment, and the, so the fix does not consist of simply changing configuration files, so uh, none of those were really fixed. Uh, so I want to point out that failure and destination consistency, since they require uh, two, two data planes in order to, to confirm that they exist, cannot actually be done with traditional data plane analysis tools that simply have a single snapshot from the running network. So this is uh, a benefit that our tool offers. So let's talk about some of the bugs that we uh, found. Uh, the running example that I showed you uh, was actually from Net2. There were uh, two routes being redistributed, one a black hole and one not a black hole. Uh, so they fixed that by increasing the cost of the black hole route. <clears throat> so that only, only one route would be installed uh, for it at any given place. Um, there were uh, some cases also in, in Net2 where um, they would implement fault tolerance using uh, multiple interfaces to underlie a VLAN, uh, and then there were unexpected cases where there was only one such interface. So we were able to discover that. Uh, for Net1, there were some interesting um, issues uh, with destination consistency. We found that um, under certain conditions, the athletics department was able to hijack traffic for the entire university. And uh, there was also another case where the dormitories were, uh, and the and one of the libraries was, were assigned one of the, the same prefixes, so the dorms were able to steal traffic that was intended for the library. Um, so we found a number of bugs. They're interesting bugs. So uh, to conclude, <laughs> um, the, uh, the benefits of, of our approach that we uh, um, are able to provide a proactive analysis while still being able to check any forwarding property. We found bugs in two major university networks, ma many of which uh, were fixed. And we, we did this using a high fidelity declarative model for the, the control plane, thereby showing that low level configs can be mapped to such models. I also want to note that these models have other use cases. So since you have the data plane of the network now, uh, you could potentially use this to transition to SDN if you wanted. You could take that data plane and toss it on a controller and distribute it uh, to a router if, if you wanted uh, to, to the uh, switches if you wanted to see uh, what you could do uh, you know, starting from the, the legacy uh, data plane. Uh, as I said, it's a real tool. It's available at batfish.org for your verification pleasure. And if you'd like to see a demo uh, and have any other questions, please come see me. Thank you. I actually have, I have a question. So you create these models of, of the data plane from the configurations. But I would, as, I would expect or, or assume that, for example, Cisco and Arista may have slightly different interpretations 
of ambiguities in protocol specifications or may just implement something differently. So did you find instances in which this could be a problem in which like if, if you were, for example, if you replaced an, a Cisco switch with an Arista switch, maybe because they have bugs in their implementations of what you're, they're different from your ideal data plane. Is that a problem? Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is something that we found actually pretty often. Uh, an egregious example is that Cisco and Juniper implement completely different BGP path selection algorithms. They have the same results in many cases, but you can certainly contrive cases where that would be a problem. And even between Cisco and Arista, we, there are different defaults. So if a, if a parameter is missing, uh, between the two. So the solution essentially is to use sort of tricks to identify exactly which language uh, something was written in, even if they look similar, and then just know what the defaults are and have that implemented in the conversion to the unified format. So uh, I think uh, part of my question was just what he asked. And uh, more generally, uh, how difficult is it to sort of start with a new protocol? that uh, is entirely new and you just want, you have to, I guess you have to manually model this uh, in the uh, control plane relation, right? Uh, is it manual or is it some sort of an automatic uh, translation from the protocol code to the uh, control plane relation? Uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't okay. able to hear that. Right you right. have a control plane relation which defines the protocol, right? Uh, to sort of capture what the protocol does, you have that relation. I'm very terrible at hearing through the microphone. Did you hear that question? Okay. Well, maybe we could take this offline. Uh, That's fine. What's the effort to add a new, a new model? For example, BGP or, or a new protocol? New oh, routing yeah, protocol. yeah. So um, it's, it's essentially implemented modularly. Um, there is this installed route relation which takes the best routes uh, that are candidate routes for each protocol and then compares them using, especially for, for Cisco, for instance, you have administrative uh, distance. So you'll have your own, each protocol will have its own way of selecting what it would be the best rules according to that protocol. And then once you have all of those different protocols, then they all get compared against each other with administrative cost and their protocol specific cost to, to find the other appropriate. So the effort is essentially, you're, you have to, add new parsing, obviously, uh, if you're going to go from a vendor language, and then you have to add logic in the data plane generator uh, to handle that protocol if it doesn't already exist. And it's really up to your ability as a programmer, I guess. It's, it's hard to quantify that effort. Thank you. Hey, Jun Kim for Joe Tech. Uh, really great work. I can actually feel the pain that you went through to model everything. Can you speak directly into the microphone? Sorry? Can you speak directly into the oh, microphone? Oh, sure. Okay. So Jun Kim from Dreadtech, I can feel the pain you went through to model everything in all these devices. Um, related to that, is there some, can you give me some examples which um, things you were not able to model? Because like these, some things are like just stupid all over the devices. You have to see all the devices. Yeah. Um, the hardest thing I think that I've encountered is dealing with regular expressions. But there, there are ways to model it. Uh, but there's not necessarily efficient ways to do it without implementing all of regular expressions in, in a declarative uh, context, which is unfortunate. But I mean, everything, we can model everything because the, the underlying um, declarative language that we're using is Turing complete. It's just tedious. <laughs> uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Right. Let's thank the speaker.